You know, Creighton's sitting at home laughing right now. <laughs> By the way, me- mentioned to you. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> See, Cre- th- it's good that he's at home. Nobody else would have reached out. Thank you, brother. Creighton's back, by the way. Um, they're just in quarantine right now because they uh, spent time with a friend who had COVID. So they're back and they're sitting at home right now watching on YouTube. Uh, so appreciate it, brother. Um, Pioneer 10 finally made its way to Saturn at 1 billion miles from the sun. At some 2 billion miles, Pluto and Uranus and Neptune became visible. And then finally, after 3 billion miles, reaching the outer edges of our small, tiny corner of our galaxy. By 1997, 25 years after its launch, Pioneer 10 was more than 6 billion miles from the sun. And despite that immense distance, Pioneer 10 continued to beam back radio signals to scientists on Earth. Perhaps most remarkable, writes Time, those signals emanate from an 8 watt transmitter, which radiates about as much power as a bedroom nightlight and takes more than nine hours to reach Earth. The little satellite that could was not qualified to do at all what it did, and yet it keeps going and going and going. By simple longevity, its tiny 8-watt transmitter radio accomplished more than anyone thought possible. This morning, I want to talk to you about somebody who accomplished something much greater than she actually thought possible. And you can go ahead and open up in your text. Matthew, the 26th chapter, is where we're going to begin at. Matthew chapter 26. This is a story that is often told, and it's often told because the scriptures, the gospels mainly, obviously, repeat this story over and over and over again. And I'll talk about that repetition and why it's repeated so much here in our text. But in Matthew chapter 26, we get an image, a snapshot, in leading up to Jesus' death on the cross. Keep in mind here, according to Matthew and according to our other gospels, we believe this is taking place very, very soon, if not right before the trial is going to take place, the Lord's Supper is going to take place. So let me begin here in verse 6 of Matthew chapter 26. Now when Jesus was in Bethany, Bethany is a small itty-bitty village outside of Jerusalem. Um, In in their day, there were a lot of villages that would surround the the much more modern big towns uh, of their time, kind of like what we have today, very rural communities, with mainly people, shepherds, living in those areas. It's not as if the city of Jerusalem could actually have shepherds living in the city. They would live out and amongst these little villages, one of them, namely Bethany, at the home of Simon the leper. Now you're going to ask me, who is Simon the leper? And I'm going to tell you I have no idea who Simon the leper actually is. Simon the leper has obviously been cured of his leprosy. He had become known as this leper, obviously, because of the disease that he had contracted. And at some point, you weren't allowed to be in contact with lepers. So we presume that obviously Jesus had healed Simon at some point during his ministry. He's nowhere really else brought up in scripture other than this instance of this house of Simon the leper. A woman came to him with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume, and she poured it out upon his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother this woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume upon my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done shall also be spoken of in memory of her. Now if you'll go ahead and look through the outline, Each and every gospel records this story taking place or, and we'll talk about it from the gospel of Luke, a similar story. 
But I want to begin by giving you a few details about the story that's not given here in Matthew. We're going to go and read it here in a little bit, but that John records. We know who this woman is. This is Mary, the sister of Lazarus. We know that to be a fact because John records it. We know the situation and what's happening in the background even. We know that Martha, Lazarus' other sister, is also there, and she's preparing dinner. She's doing something else in the kitchen. And here's Mary taking the time out of her day, taking the time out of her service. Again, they're preparing a meal here. This is going to be a dinner time special, sitting aside. I don't know what they're serving. I hope it was something good. But nonetheless, she takes the time out of her service, out of her, out of her life, to come to Jesus and to take this alabaster vial, a very costly perfume. Some of your translations will, and some of your Bibles will give you a, well, what kind of perfume was it? Um, John records that it was nard. Here's what I want you to know about it so we don't get too our far off track of what was that perfume? Sometimes if, when we read scripture, you'll ask questions that are important, but I can't tell you exactly what perfume it was. Here's what I know about it. It's costly. We're supposing, and one of the Gospels records this for us as well, that this was to be about 300 days labor of value. Very expensive. Extremely expensive. And we know that this would have probably been, given its value, one of the sweetest smells you've probably smelled in your life. I, I, I don't go to Macy's and buy perfume very often. But when I do, I skip the section that's going to cost me 300 days of work. Right? <laughs> Well, she's not, right? It was commonplace for people to have these perfumes, these vials sitting aside of perfume for special circumstances, for special occasions. If you remember in ancient times, and we still do this today, not in the same sense, but a lot of the time bodies were prepared for burial and some of the times these bodies would sit around for a while, a lot longer than we even do in our present day. We even embalm today. Well, what do you need in order to cover that scent? Very expensive, very nice smelling perfume. This is one of those instances where she came about having this expensive perfume. I have no idea, right? Was this a family heirloom that she had been given over time? Did she work in order to receive this? I have no idea. But here's what we do know about it. One of the things that the disciples bring up, and we're going to look at the chapter of John that repeats this, but it also mentions that Judas is there. And it seems to be that Judas is the one instigating all of this. Their question is, why are you wasting this? And in fact, John records that Judas not only was upset about him wasting it, but Judas was upset about the waste, not because he actually wanted to give it to the poor, but because Judas had been pilfering money from his colleagues this whole time. Judas was concerned about the money for himself. I don't know what the other disciples' thoughts were. I don't know if they were sincere in what they were bringing forth to the table before Jesus, but here's what they said. Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. Those who won't wash Jesus' feet. Number one, the greedy. Those who are too concerned about the things of this earth are the people who will be far too concerned and far too busy to give their service to Christ. We have become a nation and a culture set aside on the bound of get what you can get, live in ample while you can live in ample, and do it for your own expense. We've become a culture of that. We have turned what we know today as the modern American dream which white picket fence, nice SUV sitting in the driveway, plenty of kids, it's admirable. But it's not admirable at the expense of get what I can get and shun everything else. I believe we've become a culture that's become so busy, so focused on the material things of this world, we often can't make very much time for Christ. It's often hard to get people out of bed to come to Sunday morning worship. We live in a time where... Regardless of what people say, their actions claim, I am too busy in my service to myself that I cannot serve my Christ. And they make it clear, not in their words, but in their actions. Again, we'll read more about the disciples and Judas here. 
But I think one of their main concerns was, don't get me wrong, taking poor, care of the poor is admirable. It's admirable. But not at the expense of Christ. The Messiah is in the room. The Savior of the world, Emmanuel, is in the very room. The poor will get their funds. But don't be so focused on the material things of this world that you forget even why we are here. Do you have a hard time when you tithe taking money out of your wallet or writing the check out? <laughs> I do sometimes. Not because pff, I don't have bread on my table this week. That's one thing. Not because, pff, man, not going to be able to feed my kids this week. No, no, no. For selfish reasons. <laughs> Well, I've been saving up for this trip. I want to make sure that I have plenty to get by here in the next coming months to buy, as you can tell, I've been buying some new clothes. Right? And sometimes that ekes into your brain about the material things of this earth, and yet, why are we really here and why are we really tithing? It's not on behalf of service of myself. It's on behalf of service towards our Lord and master. And that's what makes it much easier to give. See, Mary here is much more focused on the master than she is about a costly perfume. And it's admirable to take care of the poor. It is admirable to want to meet people where they're at, but not at the expense of service towards Christ. Christ. Number two, and look over at Luke chapter 7. Now, there is a question as to whether or not Luke chapter 7 is talking about the same instance. And I will read this for you, and you can make your own determination as to whether or not you think this is the same instance. Verse 36 of Luke chapter 7. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet... He would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him that is a sinner. That she is a sinner. Here's why these instances are, are nigh on the same, and yet there are some differences to it. Number one, we have no recollection that Mary, anywhere else in Scripture, is a sinner. There are some people who read about Mary in the Scripture, and they automatically compute her to this and think, Oh, Mary, the, the sister of Lazarus, the sister of, Mary, of Martha, what a sinner. Well, I don't know if this is exactly talking about the same person here. Now, there are some instances where, obviously, it's similar, an alabaster vial of perfume. And in fact, you get this, verse 40, And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. This guy's got the same name. Right? Nowhere else in Scripture does it record that Simon the leper is a Pharisee. But we've got the same name here. Very similar situations. There are a few more differences, though. One of the things is she's weeping, and one of the things is she doesn't pour this alabaster vial on his head. There are slight differences. Very similar situations, very similar stories. But slight differences, slight variations. I was reading through commentaries, reading through online as to, are these the same situation? Most people think that it's not the same situation. It's fine if you do believe it's the same situation. It doesn't change the scripture whatsoever. But one of the things that he immediately brings up about this situation, if this man were a prophet, one thing that you should never do when you invite, and keep in mind here, he invited him over to his house, is insult your guest. If this man were a prophet, what's he doing? He's insulting Jesus. If you were actually a prophet, you'd know what kind of woman this is. Now, we insinuate, presume that we know what kind of a sinner this woman is. 
We believe her to be some form of immoral woman, who, whether through prostitution, whether through harlotry, whatever the case might be, that she sold herself as an immoral woman. We can't confirm that because it doesn't mention who this woman is, and we can't confirm, well, what exactly had she done? We just make some assumptions there. But nonetheless, not only does he insult Jesus, then he insults the woman who's come to this dinner at his table. What sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Number two, the people who won't wash Jesus' feet. The proud. The proud. Can I tell you, uh, and, and I love this quote, there's a quote from C.S. Lewis. Um, and he ends up writing it this way, and I'm going to summarize it, not a direct quote. But I always remember this and always reflect this in my mind. The one sin that we cannot stand in one another is pride, and yet we are full of. You cannot stand when somebody else should be put on the podium, but you're fine when you're up there. You're fine elevating and, and, and putting your ego forth, and you can't stand when everybody else does it. This is pride. See, Simon the Pharisee here, whether he is the same Simon leper or a different Simon here, Simon was a very common name in their day. If you recall, one of the apostles, in fact, two of the apostles were named Simon. Simon Peter, and we have another record, Simon the Zealot. We have two different examples of Simons in Scripture just from the apostles. Simon's a very common name, could have been the same guy, could have been a different guy. But nonetheless, Simon the Pharisee's got a problem. He thinks that he is greater than the woman who's coming in to wipe and to pour perfume and to weep at the feet of the Messiah. He thinks he's better. He's put himself up on the totem of Pharisee, and this is a lowly, common, sinful woman. Do you remember the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector? And he goes before the temple and he prays, and he says, Lord, thank you for not making me like everyone else, like this tax collector over here. And then the tax collector goes before Christ and he says, Lord, I'm not even worthy. And if you remember, he goes up in this, in this parable, he goes up and he won't even look up. Lord, I am not worthy of forgiveness. I'm not worthy to be called yours. See, the difference between what this woman was doing, whether it's Mary or whether it's not, the difference between what this woman is doing and what Simon is doing is pride. One is willing to humble themselves and say, you are the Messiah, you are the master, and I am unworthy. And by the way, what Simon the Pharisee forgot is he is also unworthy. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But he says this, verse 40. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. So he's just insulted him, and then he respects him again by calling him teacher. Very nice guy. A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which of them, therefore, will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged Correctly. Now, some of your translations there will say a different word than suppose. I suppose the one whom he forgave more. I always imagine Simon saying that in sarcasm. It's not a nice, I suppose. It's not, well, I suppose. It's, I suppose. Right? There's a little bit of edge to it that he gives. And Jesus says, you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house... You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my, oil, my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many... Have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? 
And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Somebody walked away that day with their sins being forgiven. And somebody walked away that day with their sins not being forgiven. You know which one is which. So in his insult, if you were a prophet, you would know what kind of woman this is. Jesus offers a parable of insult. And he offers it in this way. Two money lenders, one with a large debt, one with a small debt, forgave them both. Which one is more grateful? Which one's more thankful? Which one was forgiven more? Ah, I suppose it's this guy. Great. The one who forgives great, the one who forgives a lot, loves a lot. The one who forgives little, loves only a little. He's offering an insult parable back. If you are not willing to seek forgiveness on the behalf of others, then I can see what kind of love you have in you, Simon the Pharisee. But this woman came to me and offered me complete service. You didn't wash my feet when I came in, which was a Jewish custom for them. Dirt back in their day, they all wore sandals or were barefooted. Their feet were very dirty. It was very customary that you would walk in and immediately a servant would come before you and begin washing your feet as you reclined at their table. But he hadn't done that. He hadn't offered up that greeting. And I don't know whether it was to insult Jesus. I don't know if this was uh, just not available at the time, whatever the case might be. But this woman came in and gave me a greeting, a kiss. You have not given me anything. And she's not ceasing to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. She has not stopped anointing my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many. Let me stop there for just a moment. Jesus isn't denying that she's a sinner. I don't want you to think that we come to Christ and it's okay for the flesh to rule, because it's not. Jesus isn't saying, well, yeah, she's got sin, but no big deal. At least she's humbling. No, she was recognizing that she had a lot of sin. She came that day to anoint, to set aside the master. She knew who she was talking to. Now, I don't know if she expected to have her sins forgiven that day. I don't know if she expected the culmination of the events to take place like it did. But she knew who she was sitting before. She knew what a great and awesome teacher, prophet, master Jesus was. And Simon didn't. You did not anoint even my head with oil. She is anointing my feet with perfume. Folks, I don't know about you, but sometimes feet are nasty. Sometimes feet are the last thing that you ever want to come in contact with on a human being. And yet, she is willing to give up something precious, priceless to her, in order to worship the Savior. And here is Simon, hasn't even really given him a greeting in his house. He who loves much will be forgiven. He who is forgiven little loves little. Thirdly, the sinless. What did Simon think of himself that day? Not only was he proud, he literally thought he had no sin. He literally thought, well, this woman of the night, I can count her sins. I can tell you exactly where she's been. And Jesus knew exactly what Simon had been into. A really good turn of the table. I, I, I think Jesus did this in his insult. Simon, what have you been up to recently? Show me where your perfection is lying. Jesus said that in his parable without having to directly say it. But if you'll notice, he says to him specifically, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him. Another translation says, do you see this woman? You know how easy it is for in our, in our, in our, in our lives to use these for the viewing of everybody else, but not use these for the viewing of oneself? Right? We moved into our new apartment. It has a lot of mirrors on the closet. I told my wife, Uh, last night I said, you know, you're going to feel really weird when we wake up. We set our bed right in front of the closet mirror. I said, you're going to feel really weird when you wake up and you see yourself. She's never had that before. It's going to be totally different, even in front of our son's room. He's got a closet mirror now. 
he's going to wake up, and I'm sure one of these days we'll hear a scream, and we'll go, what's wrong? It's me, right? <laughs> Sin isn't about looking at everyone else and finding what they're doing. Sin is about looking at oneself to see where and what am I doing. Simon thought he was sinless. Simon thought, I don't need any repentance. She needs it today. Quite the opposite. Because she's on her knees bowing before the Lord, and Simon wouldn't even give a greeting. Simon wouldn't even approach him in such a way to touch his feet. I'm a Pharisee, and this woman has done nothing but kiss his feet. And he says to her, verse 48, your sins have been forgiven. And verse 50, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. John chapter 12. You guys are listening fast. I appreciate that. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was. Again, final week here. Final setting up for Jesus going to the cross. Whom Jesus had raised from the dead. He's gone to Bethany where Lazarus is. So they made him a supper there. This is at Simon the leper's house. And Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. So Lazarus and Jesus are sitting back discussing, having, having this talk. Martha's busy working in the kitchen making the dinner. Mary, therefore, took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of, of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii? And given to poor people. Now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief, and as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Do you notice what the other gospel said, what Matthew said? It wasn't just Judas who was saying this. It was the other, gospel, the other disciples who were saying this. Judas, I assume, began saying, why wasn't this sold and given to the poor? And then the other apostles join in, the other disciples say, yeah, why wasn't this sold and given to the poor? What are you thinking? Judas was a bad example there that day. Verse 7, Jesus therefore said to them, Let her alone in order that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. The great multitude therefore of the Jews learned that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests took counsel that they might put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Lazarus, the same man that Jesus had raised from the dead previously. Fourthly, the forgetful. Judas may have taken the lead on the instigation of, why don't we sell this, give it to the poor? This is worth 300 denarii, 300 days labor. Why don't we do that? Now, Judas had bad intentions behind it. Again, I don't know if the other disciples had bad intentions behind it or if they were honestly saying, why don't we give this to the poor? I assume that they were honest about it. But nonetheless, who is in the house there with them? Jesus. And right now, Mary is performing an act of gratitude, an act of adoration, and a pure act out of the goodness of her heart. And I don't even know if she understands what she's doing. Look at verse 7. Let her alone, Jesus therefore said, in order that she may keep it for the day of my burial. What's he saying here? She's preparing me for my death. Did anybody know, really, that Jesus was going to die at the end of the week? No. No. <laughs> I don't even think that Mary had a total understanding. I'm going to die at the end of the week. None of the apostles picked up on it. I don't think anybody really understood Jesus has been talking about his burial up to this point. But everybody, any time that he brought it up, they all denied it and said, yeah, whatever. They probably thought he was nuts at the time. They probably thought, what in the world are you talking about? We're not going to let you die. I don't know if Mary totally understood what she's doing. But what she's doing is setting aside the Messiah. Here he is in Simon the leper's house, and you're in his presence, and you're worried about the poor. 
Don't get me wrong, take care of the poor. But here we have the Messiah in front of us. Church, we can't be a people who forget about Christ in order to take care of the servants of Christ. It's easy to give charity. A lot of people do that. It's easy to go down to a local orphanage. I encourage you to do it. Go down to a local orphanage and take care and meet the needs of people there. But don't forget it at the expense of Christ. There are a lot of people who think that they're heaven-bound because once in a while in their lifetime, they've went and helped the less fortunate. Help the less fortunate. James chapter 1 tells us true religion is getting your hands dirty and helping out the orphans and the widows. Don't forget that. But... The Messiah is here. Jesus is here. And what has he kept telling them this whole time? She's preparing me for my burial, my death, and they still aren't getting it. I don't think Jesus repeated this idea that he's going to die and three days later be resurrected. He had told them that. I don't think he told them that so that because they couldn't understand it. I think he was trying to explain it, and they just didn't get it. They just truly didn't comprehend and wouldn't get it. And here is Jesus being totally upfront about Mary. Look at what she's doing on my behalf. The poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Not too long after this, Jesus is going to resurrect and ascend. And they won't have him, have him here on the earth anymore. Now, I don't want to read into this text that we don't have Christ anymore. Obviously, we do but we don't have them in the flesh. Folks, when you have the opportunity to serve Christ through service to others, don't forget who you're doing it for. Don't forget why they were there to eat supper. They were there to listen to Christ. They were there to listen to the words of Jesus and to, and to worship and to fellowship with them. The poor will always be there. One of these days, I hope today... <laughs> You're going to go assist the poor, a widow, in their stress, in their life, and you should. And you know what tomorrow you'll wake up and you'll do? The poor will still be there. They'll still be there. You can give of all your charity, give of all your wealth, give of all your property, and the poor will still be there. There's only one Messiah. And he did die and resurrect. And he's what our focus should be on. There is time to help the poor, but not at the expense of Christ. This morning, you came to Mantino for service and worship along with me towards our Christ. Why aren't you out helping the poor? Because there's a time and a place for helping the poor. And there's a time and a place to partake of communion and come to worship the Lord. There's a different time for everything. This was a different time for everything. Mark chapter 14. And we're just getting to the good part. Beginning in verse 3. And while he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper. And reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. Do you see where there's head mentioned there in that text? Again, there are similarities, there are differences to every gospel that's mentioned here. And that's why I say Luke chapter 7, you say, well, this one mentions head, this one mentions feet, this one mentions tears. Well, are they similar, are they the same? I'll let you figure that out. But some were indignantly remarking to one, one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor, and they were scolding her. This gospel even mentions they went so far as to scold her for it. Mary, get out of here. What are you doing? Wasting that money like that. We could have helped the poor down the street. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For the poor you always have with you, and whenever you wish, you can do them good, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. 
And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, that also which this woman has done shall be spoken of in memory of her. Can I tell you the most powerful part of this passage? Why are we talking about Mary? This is supposed to be about Jesus. Why am I telling you and giving you a sermon about an example of Mary? Do you notice what every single gospel outside of maybe Luke, and it mentions such a similar story that it could be the same story? Every single one mentions her. And this story. Do you know how rare it is that all the Gospels mention the same story? It doesn't happen very many times. The death, burial, and resurrection is mentioned in every Gospel. The feeding of the 5,000 is mentioned in every Gospel. There are only a few other stories that are mentioned, and most of them only come up once or twice. Here we have a story of Mary, the sister of Lazarus. And it's being mentioned, at least a similar story, very similar story being mentioned in every single gospel. Why is it mentioned so many times? Why are things repeated so many times? They're important, and you'll remember it. You'll remember it. I, when I started studying this, I went, duh. By the way, there's an old George Fall joke, one of my professors. I don't know if you know of any George Fall. He said, when we get to heaven, we're going to have flat foreheads because when we get there, we're going to be going so many times. Folks, this is mentioned so many times so that we'll remember it. We'll remember Mary and what she did. The transfiguration isn't mentioned in every four, in every gospel. It's important, but it's not mentioned in every gospel. There are plenty of stories that aren't mentioned in every gospel. Her story is. She is remembered in every gospel. You pick up John today. You read through John, you're going to see Mary. You pick up Mark today, you're going to read about Mary. You pick up Matthew today, you're going to read, read about Mary. You cannot read a gospel without, men, without seeing Mary or a very similar description of, this, of a similar story happening. Maybe it's not her, maybe it is. You're going to read about it every time you pick up the Gospels, every time you read through them, so that we'll remember it and we'll remember about what focus and servitude toward Christ really is. You'll remember it every time. Every time, and this is why Jesus mentions it, and I believe it's amazing. Jesus had such concern for Mary and this situation. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, wanted this story to re be remembered over and over and over again in servitude towards Christ. And she was being scolded, she was being belittled, whether the same woman or not, got called a sinner. Every single time. And it's there so we'll remember it and we'll study it and we'll examine it and we'll know what servanthood and being focused on it towards Christ is really about. We speak of Mary every gospel when we speak of Christ. Every time, every time, you end up talking about Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who anointed Jesus' feet when nobody else would. Last passage, Acts chapter 9. Is it hot in here or is it just me? Whew. I hope it's just me. For your guys' expense, I hope it's just me. All that moving yesterday... I watched them move most of the time, and I was tired watching. <laughs> I had to direct everything. Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 36. Now in Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which translated into Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it came about that at the time she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, entreating him, Do not delay to come to us. And Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him into the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. 
And he gave her his hand and raised her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came about that he stayed many days in Joppa with a certain tanner, Simon. By the way, there's another Simon in the Bible. You know what I love about Tabitha's story? Every time I read this story, I can't help but think of this. Who did they call, or I should say, when did they call on Peter to come resurrect the dead on behalf of Christ? It wasn't when the preacher died. It wasn't when one of the elders died. It wasn't when one of the deacons died. It was when Tabitha died. And by the way, what was her work? What did she do so saintly in the church? The only thing that's mentioned is she made tunics and garments. She made quilts. She made shirts and pants for people. I assume that was her ministry. They showed it off. They said, Peter, come look at all that she's done. You know what she did in the church? She sewed and she quilted. I mean, that, that was her gift. That was her talent. And do you know how much it meant to the church? In Lydda, near Joppa, it meant everything. Everything. Why why was this such a great ministry? Because she was focused on serving Christ, and she did it through whatever means that she could. If it meant pouring pure nard on the Savior's feet, Mary did it. But if it meant making tunics and garments, Tabitha did it. That's what she did. Every time I think, you know, they let... They, they let the elders in that church die. <laughs> they didn't call an apostle for that. They didn't call, when a deacon passed, they were like, well, on to the next one. That was a joke. <laughs> they called an apostle for Tabitha. She was focused on her service however she could on behalf of the Messiah. This is why the song goes, seek ye first the kingdom of God, seek it first. The poor you will always have. But take your talents, take your service, and focus it on Christ. It'll mean the world to the rest of the church. It'll mean the world to Christ. It will mean absolutely everything imaginable to the people around. Last illustration. You may recognize this this name. John Kenneth Galbraith. He was a Canadian economic advisor, and he was often called into American politics for, uh, for his knowledge and for his wisdom in that area. In his autobiography, A Life in Our Own Times, he illustrated the devotion of his housekeeper, Emily Wilson. It had been a very long day. He had been receiving phone calls all day, working all day, and he had asked her to hold all telephone calls while he took a nap. Shortly thereafter, the phone rang, and who would it be but President Lyndon Johnson on the line? And he was calling from the White House. He said, get me Ken Galbraith. This is Lyndon Johnson. And his housekeeper replied, he is sleeping, Mr. President. He said not to disturb him. Well, wake him up. I want to talk to him. No, Mr. President. I work for him not you. When I called the president back, he could scarcely control his pleasure in what she said. Tell that woman I want her here in the White House. Apparently he needed some naps. Total focus. Total servanthood. Pioneer 10. Total focus on its goal. Mary. Total focus on her goal. Tabitha, total focus on their goal. Don't serve this world, serve this world, but don't do it at the expense of Christ. Church, there are a lot of people running around today who are, I mean, according to our world, according to our culture, good people. They're good people, and they're good servants. They'll serve me and you, right? The restaurant worker down at McDonald's who's doing a good job, good for them. Good for them. I appreciate it, right? When my burger comes out exactly how I want it, thank you. I'm appreciative of it. But don't do it at the expense of Christ. We've got him here 
now, today. Make that decision today. Because you will always have the poor. Always. You will always have the downtrodden, the widow, and the orphan. They will always be there. But you won't always have the decision and the time to make for Christ. You just won't. I implore with you today, make that decision today. Mary is remembered every time you pick up the Gospels. Every time. That's special. And Jesus wanted it to be special. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be awesome every single time Jesus is mentioned, if your name came up? Wouldn't that be awesome? That's what focusing on servanthood is all about. Church, if you have that decision to make today, as we stand and sing our final hymn, I, I push and I push for the cause of Christ. That's why I'm here before you. That's why I moved to Joliet. You think I want to move back to Illinois? And I'm doing it because I know where I want to put my focus on my servanthood. And I want to do that for you, and I want you to do it along with me. Let's stand and sing our last hymn.